A very warm welcome to all our listeners around the world. You're welcome to the Tony Tukumbo Fernandez Show, the show that promotes the true life and success stories of African and Caribbean achievers around the world. So if there's a product or initiative you wish to share, feel free to give us a call. The number is 0788-280-9005. That number once again is 0788-280-9005. And also take time to visit our website at www.tonyfernandez.co.uk. Also watch this space for our Black History Month celebrations taking place at the UK House of Parliament on Friday the 28th of October. And also watch this space for my documentary titled What Makes Lagos So Special? Coming your way in 2022. And we have an amazing, amazing guest on the show this evening. He is a wonderful gentleman born on the 14th of October 1953 in St. Philip's Barbados. He was the first black cricketer to represent England here in the UK and he also has a history of being a football and cricket coach, author, mentor, TV and radio commentator. He has his fingers in so many pies and it's such a pleasure to meet for the very first time, uh, Mr. Ronald Butcher. Uh, lovely to meet you this evening for the very first time, sir. Uh, and you're looking very relaxed and calm. And, and I'm sure our listeners around the world are dying to know a bit about yourself, your background, and the things in life you're most passionate about. Tony, well, thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to meet you also. Thank you, sir. So, uh, yeah, the listeners would like to know a bit about yourself, your background, and the things you're most passionate about in life. Yes, basically, uh, background, I was born in Barbados, as you said, in 1953. I was born in East Point, St. Philip, which is the most eastern part of the island. Uh, a very rural sort of area. So, uh, in terms of the sort of things that you can actually do as a kid, they're fairly limited in that because you're in such a rural area. And in those days, uh, Barbadians are quite strange people. They will believe that even though St. Philip is only about 14 or 15 miles away from the capital, Bridgetown, they believe that it's to hell and back. So <laughs> quite often they wouldn't come to that area or you wouldn't actually go into the town area. So you had to really make the sort of things that you wanted for yourself in, in, in those areas. You were also limited in terms of, from a sporting context, the sort of sports that you could get involved with. Um, so basically, all that was available to you was cricket um, or track and field. Um, you didn't have access to tennis or golf or any of those other um, fantastic sports. So. I naturally got involved with cricket. It's just a sport that I enjoyed um, listening to because I spent most of the time listening to cricket on the radio from Australia or in other places. Um, and just got an interest in the game. I did have a family member um, in the in international sport, international cricket, Basil Butcher, but he, he was from Ghana. He was born in Ghana. His father, Ethelbert Butcher, was from our area, but emigrated to Barbados 
emigrated to Ghana years previously. So obviously I took an interest in the game for that reason, that, that he was a, a star of a stadium player, but also it's a game that I, I just got to enjoy. And I was there until I was 13 plus, 13 and a half. I came to England in 1967. Um, very, very strange experience. Uh, my parents had been in England since the 50s, but I was brought up by my grandmother, myself and my sister, Margaret. Uh, my father wanted me here um, much earlier, but my grandmother, you know, grandmothers are very protective and their thinking was, why would I want to send him all the way over there in the cold? So she resisted for many years and eventually she sent me in 1967. Uh, strangely arriving in England, it was in May. I thought the weather should have been fine. As you know in Barbados, the weather is 365 days of the year. It's warm. And uh, In May in England, I just found it was absolutely freezing. So it, it took a while to settle into English life because I also came to find that I had um, two brothers and two sisters as well, other sisters as well. So it was a whole readjustment in terms of readjusting to a new country, whether making new friends, also readjusting to a new family because you hadn't seen your family for many years. But, you know, kids are fairly resilient. and You get involved in various different things. Um, I got involved with football because in Barbados, everybody played cricket. In England, nobody was playing cricket or in the streets. Everybody was playing football. So I eventually got involved with the game and fell in love with the game and did pretty well in the game also. But as I say, the rest is history. I mean, it, it's a long process to finally making my way to, um, to the England team. But that's pretty much part of the, the early part of my um, time here in England. When we talk about um, readjusting and adapting to new environments, when we talk about creating legacies that last forever, you were the first ever black cricketer to represent England, which is very, very, a very beautiful feeling and thoughts historically. What was the feeling like for that? But also, what kind of racial challenges also came with that in those days? Well, obviously, I will work backwards first and, um, and really talk about my youth here. Yeah, having arrived in England, uh, you know, suddenly you were seeing, particularly where I lived in Stevenage in Hertfordshire, which was a new town. And in actual fact, my father, who had been there since the mid 50s, he was the first black man in, in Stevenage in Hertfordshire. So when I arrived in 67, uh, there weren't too many black people in, in Stevenage. So that also was a culture shock that, you know, the entire town uh, was white. I mean, I, I did have some exposure to white people before in Barbados because living in, in rural areas like we lived, you know, your family tended to work at, on the plantations. So, you know, that's how you came into contact um, with white people in Barbados at that time. So coming here and suddenly, you know, you're seeing all white faces and no black faces. And, and even the school that I went to, uh, which was a very large secondary school in England, I don't think they had four black kids in, in the entire school. So that was um, a bit of readjusting and it was a bit of readjusting for those kids as well because they had been used to seeing white faces and now they were seeing a black face. So things didn't always go smooth, as you can you could understand on both sides. But I mean, despite that, um, once I was away from school and involved with local cricket, now that was a different situation because um, Stevenage Cricket Club was very very um, open. Um, it was quite diverse. They had players in the team from, you know, they had a black player in the team. They had, before me, they had 
people from South Africa. So it was a very mixed team. And um, they really embraced me as a, as, as a person. I, I think, believe, I believe they thought that here was a young man who was crazy in love with the, with the sport and, and, and they reciprocated and, and really looked after me. So I, I had a very good grounding um, from Stevenage um, as a club player. And then really right through towards my journey in the England side. Now, when you said when I played for England, obviously, you know, it's a great achievement because as a small boy in Barbados, um, and I love the game of cricket, my ambition was and goal was to play test cricket. But at that time, you're thinking about playing for the West Indies because you have no idea how your life is going to unfold. But when the time came that I was selected for England, um, it was, you know, a, a fulfillment of the dream that I had many years ago. Um, so I didn't pay, pay too much attention to the fact that I was a black player representing England and the first one. I, I didn't pay a lot of attention to that because I was more caught up in the moment of, yes, this is my opportunity and wanting to do well. Obviously, much later, um, being black. Uh, became more significant to me and to other people as well. But I certainly enjoyed my time um, with England, for sure. How important do you feel it is to be caught up in that moment and be passionate in that moment to fulfil your dream? I think it's vitally important because when you have worked hard for something and then you get it, I don't think you should really be worrying about what people say, what people think, what people expect of you. What you should be concentrating on is, no, I have attained what I set out to attain. No, I want to do it the best that I can and for as long as I can. And that was the only thing going through my mind was, yes, I've got to this point. This is where I've been aiming for. I want to enjoy this, I want to do well, and I want to do it for a long time. So those are the only things really that you should be concerned and caught up about. Don't get caught up with um, the politics or the, the color or whatever, that, that, that's not important. You, while you were working all of those years, you were not thinking about politics, you were not thinking about color, you were just thinking about being excellent at what you wanted to do. And that really should be the only thing you should concentrate on. Now, you've also been a TV and radio commentator, football and cricket coach, author, mentor. You've managed boards. There is a, a big entrepreneurial spirit in you. How and when did that entrepreneurial journey begin? Can you remember the very first moment? Um... Oh, I think really while I was here in England, because when you, you, get, you get exposed to so many different things and what I've been exposed to throughout my um, life in England, I actually lived in England for 37 years before I went back to Barbados in 2004. Um, and I, I only went back to Barbados because I was offered a position at the university as director of sport. And I thought it would be a good challenge. Um, it was a new post created within the university. And, you know, I went as a challenge, as it was since then. I ended up staying 15 years as director of sport and retired uh, three years ago. But what I would say is that during my time as a professional cricketer in England, I think because of the environment that I was in and the people that I was meeting, uh, I think it became, I wouldn't say easy, but I had much more options in terms of looking to be entrepreneurial because I was mixing with those type of people all the time. Um, people who are, you know, very, who are very successful in business, et cetera, et cetera. So and I was always mindful that sport, obviously it's a wonderful thing, but it has a certain shelf life. And at the end of that shelf life, I didn't want to be sitting down, you know, thinking of those glory days. For me, 
uh, when my days came to finish professional cricket, that was the end of a chapter for me. I parked that and I looked to move on um, to the next chapter. I, I never looked back um, in, in relation to that. So all of those things prepared me for when I finished playing cricket. And I, and I believe that the, the 20 years I spent as a professional cricketer, that really prepared me um, for what I am doing now and have been doing for the last 20 years or so. I think it's a very good uh, bonus in our world today when we have vision, when we have foresight, and when we have um, purpose. Um, what would you say makes a good entrepreneur? Well, I think in terms of being an entrepreneur and a good one is you, it's like sport. You, you, you must spot opportun opportunities. Um, you know, a, a good coach, et cetera, you know, he, he identifies trends, he identifies weaknesses, et cetera, et cetera, long before um, they become a weakness. So I think as an entrepreneur, you also have to have that kind of um, spirit. You're always looking for um, the gaps, um, you know, so you, you must be thinking ahead. Obviously, they don't always work, but there's no point trying to think like everyone else because, you know, if a million people are trying to do the same thing, uh, you're not all going to be successful. So I believe that you really should be taking a good, long, hard look at and ask yourself really, you know, what will the future be like uh, and try to predict uh, what's going to happen in the future and plan for that. If you can do that, then you'll be ahead of the game and you will not be reactive when you reach that point. You, you'll be very proactive. So I've always taken that philosophy with me that here I know is fine, uh, but the future is something that I always look at. Sometimes people say uh, being an entrepreneur, you also have to be as crazy enough to think outside the box. How much of that do you believe in? Yeah, you, you do have to think outside the box because um, safety, you know, doesn't get you anywhere. I mean, most of the great um, entrepreneurs are people who have taken risk. You, you must take calculated risk. You don't, you don't take foolhardy risk, but you must take um, calculated risk. You must also align yourself with people who have been successful. If you align yourself with somebody who's been a failure, the chances are that you'll become a failure. So you have to align yourself with somebody who has walked the walk already and um, know you could follow in their footsteps. When I say follow in their footsteps, I don't mean literally follow in their footsteps, but I mean that they have been successful and there is a reason why they're successful. So you, you try to really find out from them. Um, I wouldn't say the secret because there's no great secret to success because you need a lot of luck as well. But um, you get to understand um, also some of the pitfalls that they encountered. And so they can warn you of those, of, of those pitfalls. And some of them, obviously, you, you can avoid. But more importantly, they are proven success. Whatever they have been doing, there was an end return. So those are the sort of people that you align yourselves with. And, um, you know, and they will help you and other people will help you along the way. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I don't do things for myself. Um, I, I really look to do things for my family, for my community, for my country, and where possible, you know, for mankind. So it is not as if I want to achieve a whole heap of things for myself and sit in an ivory tower and, and, and look at it every day and feel great. That, that, that is not me at all. In doing things for yourself, for your family, for your community, for your country, and for the benefit of all our listeners listening around the world today, what initiatives are you working on at the moment that you think our listeners should know about and how can they get involved? Well, at the moment, um, you know, I'm doing a number of things. Um, coming up on Monday, I have um, 
some cricket training cricket bats launch at Lords on Monday. And these bats were three bats that I designed many years ago while I was in England. Um, and it really was done because of the technical flaw that was in my game as a professional, which I couldn't solve. Um, I learned to live with it, but I couldn't solve it. So it, it really um, bothered me. So after my career ended, I set out to design something that would assist in that. Um, and having designed um, one particular cricket bat, which then was trialed and proven to be to be right, I thought to myself, well, someone who has the opposite problem to me, then they also need a bat as well. So I designed that one for them. Um, so I designed three and all, had them then scientifically tested at Loughborough University, uh, who did a two-year study and produce a thesis and and I've had this all these I've had it all these years but I didn't do anything about it because having gone to Barbados as director of sport and I said it was a new position I had to build an entire sporting um, infrastructure um, in the university from from the beginning so for 15 years you know, I was very, very busy with work, um, traveling and pressures, etc. So coming towards the end of my um, time at university, a couple of years ago, I decided, look, I have two projects um, that I started that I must finish. And one was to get the bats um, to market. So on Monday, we have the launch. And the other one was the finishing of a soccer coaching manual that I had started all those years ago. Now I finished that, um, I think, summer 2020. I finished that um, and that is out. I know this is the latest um, project that I'm bringing to market on Monday. On Monday. And we will watch out for that. If uh, people want to get to know more about you, are there any social media handles or how can they reach you? Well, I mean, yes, I am I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, um, Facebook, Instagram. Um, if you're asking me what what what's the handles are right now, um, I, I have <laughs> I couldn't tell you straight off. But I yes, I am um, all of those things, and um, and yes, I mean you know people see me around all the time. I'm 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 here this summer, particularly um, commentating. I'm commentating for the BBC, so I'm traveling all around the country, um, commentating on the championship matches. So, you know, I'm around for, for the next couple of months for sure. And then I'm back in October for Black History Month. And we hope to see you in Black History Month. As you well know, life is all about creating legacies to make the world a better place. And here you are creating legacies. Talking about creating legacies, and on a very final note, what message do you have for all our African and Caribbean listeners around the world today? Well, the message really for all the Caribbean and African listeners around the world is that the world really is your oyster. Um, you must drink, you must dream big and do not let people put you off um, achieving that dream. Um, recognize and understand, yes, that people will say you cannot do that uh, because you are black or you didn't go to this school or or whatever, you will always have those people, even within your own family, there will be people who will doubt um, what you can do. But what I would say to all of our people is, remain focused to whatever it is you want to achieve, work towards it. You, you, you never know when you're gonna get there, but if you don't start that journey and keep on that journey, you will never get there. So dream big, work hard, and when you do get um, to that point, also help others to get to that point as well. So I th that is very important for our people. So proud of you, sir. Amazing to be with you this evening. Keep up the amazing work. And I'm sure we're going to keep in touch very soon. And God bless you. Thank you. Great pleasure, Tony. Thank you.